Hey guys, David here and welcome to another Dark Art Guitars build. Today we're gonna finish the cyberpunk guitar build that I started previously and we're gonna go into a lot of details in this video. Now due to the way how GTBO uh, works, the deadline was fast approaching so I had to release the final video where I show everything already so there's a good chance you've already seen it but here I'm gonna go much more into detail, show you more of the steps and explain everything. But if you don't want a half hour video, but instead just a 10 minute one, then you can go ahead and check out the final video where I quickly go over everything in a nice montage. Now recapping what we've done last time, I cut out all of the woodwork on the CNC using various techniques that a bunch of blue ups for the neck and uh, having everything nicely sorted. I also got started on a bit of the sanding and uh, the inlay is done as well. Now the last episode ended on a bit of a cliffhanger with me uh, going prematurely into the final glue up and forgetting a couple of things. Now one of the things I completely forgot about was the side dots. I alluded to it earlier and it's a lot easier to drill those uh, if the neck is separate from the body since then you can just easily use any drill and have easy access. Now all of the higher frets are right next to the body and there's no clearance for me to get my uh, power drill in whatsoever. But luckily I had this old hand drill still lying around that is very low profile and has quite a narrow chuck. For this tiny 2mm drill bit it just barely works and has enough clearance with the body here. Now I wouldn't want to drill a lot with that but for these little side dart holes this worked a treat and I was really happy to be able to use this thing that I have not used in basically forever. Then installing it went just like every other time so it was actually not really a big deal whatsoever to install this now after the fact but uh, I was racking my brain for a little while uh, how I could drill these holes until I rediscovered that old drill. You can see I'm just using some super glue uh, to uh, glue some uh, two millimeter aluminum wire into these holes. This will give some nice uh, aluminum side dots uh, it's, and it's quite soft and easy to work with and then filing down the excess and we're good to go. Then after that I moved on to a bunch of little jobs. One of the things was I wanted to nicely chamfer all of these edges for these holes and this was quite the process, getting those all nice and even by hand. Uh, in retrospect it would have been a lot easier to do that on the CNC but well if you've seen the last video uh, I had just about enough CNC for it at the moment. Using a scalpel blade and then later some files and uh, some sandpaper uh, worked well but took definitely some time. Then the next thing was to get started on the bridge and but before the bridge I'm also making uh, the little ferrules that hold the strings in uh, at the back. I have one piece here that is going to hold all seven strings in and I'm just machining this with my killer bee out of some uh, aluminum. Using a single foot end mill cutting aluminum on the killer bee works a treat and you can actually go quite fast. Of course this for it here is slightly sped up but this whole operation only took a couple of minutes. And while the final finish is not as high of quality as you might get from a professional milling center, it is still really good and with just a little bit of sandpaper all of the machining marks easily buff out. Now the bridge uh, was quite a bit more uh, involved and I first started out with a big 6mm end mill, also single fluid, to cut out the bulk of the material. I really didn't have the perfect size stock for this so the one I used was like almost twice as thick and I had to machine away a lot of material to get to what I'm actually wanting but it was easier than going to the metal supplier to get more material. And then I'm um, just going in with a smaller, uh, I think one or two millimeter end mill uh, to cut out the slot, the holes for the strings, as well as the slots where the wires from the piezo pickups will go through. By having slots for those wires, that means when I adjust the intonation and move the saddle back and forth, the wire always uh, fits through nicely without getting caught on anything. Now after that, with some sanding, this bridge looked perfect, but if I were to use it just like that, it would very quickly get scratched up and not look nice anymore at all. So I'm going ahead and anodizing it and you can either get your stuff sent out to anodize or it's actually fairly easy to do at home. I will not go into all the details here in this video because I have a separate video uh, where I went into the details of making that and I'm using basically the exact same setup as last time. I have not used it since uh, but it worked fine. It's um, like 
by no means a professional. I don't have much experience. So uh, in the end, uh, I think my uh, analyzing layer here was actually really thick. I had to sand away some. Uh, so I could have probably gone off with half the time, but it's kind of hard to judge uh, without much experience. And I wouldn't rather have too thick of an analyzing instead of too thin. I'm also not dyeing the parts here. That's another thing that you can commonly do with anodizing. You could dye black, red, or whatever color you want. But I actually wanted silver, so you cannot really tell a big difference. Uh, the, the color slightly changes, and it has a slightly more matte appearance. But the main reason why I'm anodizing here is just for the extra durability and protection that it does not get scratched up. It is uh, important though to keep in mind that anodizing does create an insulating layer. So if you uh, want to contact the strings and in the ferrules and as well for your grounding wire, you do have to sand away the anodizing for it to ground properly. Otherwise it will not conduct through. Then going back to some more bodywork, I still had this big gouge from last time where the CNC uh, went haywire and uh, scooted straight across the entire guitar and leaving a big gouge in the body. So what I decided was to, well, embrace it and uh, make it even more visible. I added some extra uh, little lines and uh, some other indentations to make it look a bit like a scar in the back of the guitar. I didn't go ahead and film it, but afterwards I also filled in this scar, as I'm gonna call it, uh, with some purple uh, epoxy, just uh, used some uh, purple mica powder in some uh, epoxy and put it in there. I didn't completely fill it flush, but just to uh, make it pop even more. Now, since the mahogany has a lot of big open pores, I'm using some uh, grain filler here. And it is the same color as mahogany once it dries. And uh, this just makes it so that I have to use a lot less finish uh, to be able to get a nice smooth surface. Now, I just put a bunch of it on here, try to scrape off as much as possible, uh, and then sand it back. But uh, uh, some people uh, on Instagram have mentioned that you can use a rag to kind of rub it in and then there's less excess. So that I'll definitely try that next time. But it sands away fairly easily, so it didn't take all that long. I also filled in the neck with the Paduk and the Wenge. And while the color doesn't match perfectly there, it still looks somewhat okay and uh, makes it so that uh, it was able to fill in the neck easier. If I was uh, going really fancy, I could have filled in the Wenge and Paduk with separately colored uh, filler, but I think this worked out perfectly fine. And since there's a lot of color variation in the wood anyhow, uh, it just gives a bit lighter accents instead of slightly darker accents. Then it is finally time to stain the top. I'm starting off with the headstock since it's a smaller surface and going first over it with some black dye and then sanding it back uh, to just kind of deepen the nice flame figure and make it create more contrast in it. Now on the body, since it is not as perfectly flamed, uh, that didn't work quite as well. There are some areas uh, where I ended up with some dark uh, spots and uh, well, in retrospect, I'm not sure if I really should have used the blackening uh, step there. It works really well if you have even flame everywhere as then uh, only one part of the flame will accept the color. But if you have areas that don't have a lot of flame or especially on the end uh, grain that is exposed uh, on the bevels here, uh, it soaks up a lot of uh, the stain as well and creates a darker area that is just evenly dark and uh, kind of doesn't look too great or, or requires a lot of sanding to get back. Then time for the purple. I did order some purple stain from Crimson, but I must have gotten like a defective bottle or something. At least the vibrancy of the purple compared to the blue and the red I also got to mix my own purple or like change the hue slightly. Uh, the blue and the red were a lot more vibrant and like as vibrant as I would want it and expect it. And whereas the purple was barely even visible. Uh, I did mix it up well. I guess they just uh, messed up that one bottle, but not to worry. I had red and blue, so I mixed all my own purple. But getting the shade just right is quite Quite difficult because the liquid and the wet color and the dried color all look completely different from each other. So uh, it might go on and look very blue and that, but then when it's dry it actually looks quite red. So it took me a couple attempts and uh, in the end I ended up with a fairly dark purple uh, after lacquering but here it actually looks still very light. So definitely should have done test pieces for this. I did some test pieces but not nearly enough. Uh, but well live and learn. In the end, uh, this guitar already has a bunch of uh, learning uh, experiences in it, so the finish is just adding to that list. To get into the little uh, 
areas where the holes are cut in and just using a brush to apply the same stain. And you have to be careful that you uh, don't leave too much uh, on the flat surfaces and keep wiping that off. Otherwise you will say kind of outlines of where you left some extra stain. As, uh, well, at some point the wood is saturated. If you leave it on top of your surface, it still kind of dries and uh, makes it darker. Then in the next step, the mahogany really comes to life. I'm applying some uh, sanding sealer that just kind of seals up the pores and makes sure that the grain doesn't rise too much uh, when I start applying the finish. You could skip this step, but uh, it is very satisfying and I wanted to try out this product and I think it looks uh, quite nice. Afterwards, I just kind of went in with some quite fine sandpaper and knocked back any of the raised grain and make sure that it was nicely flat. And with the sanding sealer applied, also the guitar was protected enough that I felt like I could not procrastinate on the fretwork any longer. I don't have the excuse anymore of the guitar being fragile and not wanting to get any dirt on it. Uh, so I went ahead and first started off leveling the fretboard and making sure that it is nicely flat uh, I would have used some radius blocks, but this is compound radius going from 350 to 500 millimeters. Uh, so instead I'm just using a leveling beam and using some radius gauges to make sure that I don't uh, sand too flat or too coarse of a radius. Then for the fret work, I want to do semi-hemispherical fret ends. So for that, I used this uh, stone Dremel wheel and just kind of uh, used a diamond uh, like dressing stick. You can get those fairly cheaply uh, uh, online and they're used to kind of condition uh, stone wheels. And I used that to kind of scribe in the shape of the fret ends. It took me a couple of attempts. I would scribe in what roughly looks uh, correct and then uh, use a fret wire to make sure that uh, the kind of radius uh, looks about good. And then by using that and just kind of going back and forth and around and looking at it a million times and doing a couple of attempts, I was able to uh, nicely run over the end of one side of the fret wire. Then to uh, smooth out all of the scratches from the stone, I'm using some sandpaper uh, of varying uh, coarseness. I think I started with uh, to some 220 and then uh, went up to like 400 or 800 or something like that. And then finishing off with some steel wool to uh, shine it up. I will polish them again later, but this just makes them look nice and poppy and it's not that much work. I also usually kept one of the uh, frets close by to compare them and make sure that the ends look all about the same. It's quite quite a bit of uh, trial and error to make sure that all of them look the same. Uh, they're not perfectly semi-hemispherical, but as long as they all look the same, it will look fine. But getting them all the same took a couple of attempts. That's why I also started doing one of the sides of all of them first, because it doesn't matter how much I take off. If it's not the right shape, I can just grind off a bit more until it's the perfect shape and don't have to worry about the length. And after I did 24 of them, well, I felt like I already had a bit of experience. Then to get the length perfect, I'm inserting them slightly into the fret slots, lining up one side how I want it and making a mark uh, at the end. Just gonna have to get a feel for how much extra you need, especially with the uh, slanted threads. Uh, takes a couple tries. I just kind of kept them a bit too long first, cut them, started uh, uh, sphericalizing them, and then if the thread was still too long, I just kind of spent a bit more time uh, making uh, the nice end round over. And uh, if at any point you grind off too much by starting on the 24th thread and then working your way down, if the fret becomes too short, you just use it for the next fret and retry it for the higher fret. I had to do this, this a couple of times, uh, but in the end it worked out fine. And uh, while this process definitely took quite a long time, uh, I think the end result is quite amazing. And even though I did not know what I was doing, uh, they all look relatively the same length and evenly rounded over. And after installing them, well, uh, it's the same as with any other fret job, uh, level, crown polish, all of that good stuff. Uh, so I first started off with the leveling beam, I don't think I filmed it here, and uh, making sure that all of them are perfectly level using a fret rocker, a straight edge. And uh, after I was pretty sure that they're all perfectly level, I uh, went in with a crowning file and then uh, some sandpaper 
up to like 600 grade or something like that. And then I uh, also went in with some thread rubbers from Crimson uh, to get the shine up a bit. And then finally uh, using uh, some polishing compound on a polishing wheel uh, to get that perfectly reflective sheen. Now I did not mask off uh, the uh, fretboard itself while doing the polishing and that's kind of up to you depending on whether you want a slightly more matte fretboard or if you do also want a glossy fretboard and uh, shining that up. Polishing ebony works quite well as well so just polishing everything at the same time and then cleaning all the residue off after this was a good result for me. I did put down a layer of uh, oil on the fretboard before I installed the frets as well so that it the wood does not discolor from uh, any of the dust and all of the like residue from everything. With the fretwork done, it was time to also make the nut. And I'm uh, cutting it out of brass here by hand. Uh, just kind of use the square brass bar, cut it down with a saw, and then using a file uh, to get the shape uh, to what I want. At first I had it fairly thick and while that looks beautiful uh, I already had a lot of neck dive with all the tuners installed so I decided to thin down the knot quite a bit to make it lighter and uh, with brass that actually makes a quite big difference. Then to cut the slots for the strings I started off uh, with a handsaw to just kind of mark the locations after I marked them with a sharpie and then I'm using uh, these knot slotting files and while they do cost quite a bit of money if you want to make your own nuts, it's basically mandatory. With those, you can just get the one that's perfect for your string gauge file until it's deep enough and it will look perfect and the string will fit, it will not be sloppy. I've tried doing it without before or with a very cheap set and uh, it was just a nightmare. So uh, I'm very happy that I got these Hosco uh, nut slotting files. Otherwise, if you do not want to slot your own knot, you can get pre-slotted knots uh, and if you don't have too funky of a uh, fan thread angle uh, that is also a perfectly valid option. Then for the finishing I'm using this 2k uh, spray lacquer. It's water-based uh, two-part uh, uh, lacquer so you have to first activate it and then shake it and follow the instructions on it but it basically gives a bit of a harder finish than just a regular water-based lacquer. It's quite a bit more expensive than a regular lacquer, but uh, I've had mixed results with regular lacquer and this one is really nice and hard. Now I had a bunch of other problems, but they were not related uh, to the wrong kind of lacquer. The only downside is that once you activate a can, you have to use it within 24 hours or otherwise it like hardens within uh, the can or something, uh, which is a bit of a pain. And it means that you will likely waste some, but you know, there's no way around it. Then ideally you would uh, use a spray booth for this or you well would do it in some other manner. I don't have any of that so I'm just doing it outside here and you can see it's a bit of a too windy of a day for this so it would be quite close to not waste a bunch of product but that meant that well the finish uh, application was not as perfect as it could have been. But well uh, at this point I was already running really close to the deadline so I did not really have any time to set up uh, something big or wait for the perfect weather or anything like that. I just had to finish this build as quickly as possible. So I uh, applied two cans of that uh, spray finish that's uh, seven or eight coats or something like that and then went ahead and uh, sanded it flat. Now usually with water-based finish you should not wet sand. Uh, I think since it's a two-part finish and I did let it uh, like properly uh, cure uh, before I uh, sanded it, uh, water, wet sanding is fine but if you want to be on a safe side you should probably dry sand it anyhow. Now the big challenge with sanding the lacquer back is sanding enough that you get a nice flat finish but not sanding through on any of the edges. Now I was doing quite well uh, almost all the way uh, around until at some points I did sand through and uh, like applying stains at this uh, point uh, sometimes it works or but this was too variable so it really did not work out as well as I had hoped. So I did what I now regret and uh, decided to just kind of sand intentionally through on a bunch of the edges to make it uh, look kind of weathered but in the end this just kind of looks weird uh, in my opinion. Uh, like everything else about the guitar is nicely finished uh, and then there's just kind of these bright highlights. 
So I should have just either left that one spot and lived with it or uh, tried to uh, somehow fix it and live with it being an imperfect fix. But, well, at this point I was definitely not uh, seeing clearly anymore. I just had finish, finish, finish in my mind. And, well, that's what you get for rushing. My goal with this finish was to have a, a pretty mad finish. I didn't want a high gloss partially because I didn't have the time or the equipment to polish it to a high gloss, but also I usually prefer matte guitars. However, this matte lacquer was very matte. And I mean, if you're looking for a perfectly matte uh, guitar, that is great. But uh, with the lacquer, it just really did not pop. The colors from the stain were very muted and uh, you could almost not see any of the flame anymore. Just having it wet uh, from wet sanding made everything pop. So I figured I did want to do something because it looked so much better when it was wet. So what I did, went ahead and did it was using some high build uh, guitar finishing oil on top of the lacquer after it was uh, fully cured. And that actually worked a treat. It kind of retained some of the madness, but uh, really made the colors pop and uh, gave it a bit of a sheen. I, so far, I it cured well after like a week or two and uh, was perfectly fine. I uh, will have to see how it holds up in the long term. I will use that on a client build uh, just because it seems wrong putting an oil finish on top of a lacquer, but so far it, I'm surprised by how well it works. Then finishing touches, taking all of the masking off, uh, putting the covers on and installing the hardware. This is the really fun part where it's starting to come together. And if you are not too rushed, then this can be quite enjoyable. At this point, I also made the pickups, which I have a completely separate video for, so I will not show the process here, but I want my own uh, pickups with custom bobbins and everything. So do make sure to check out that video. I think they turned out really cool. Uh, but otherwise, it's just installing uh, parts into any guitar, uh, installing the bridge, feeding through all of the wires for the piezo pickups. I had to use like a little loop on a that I bent out of a wire to fish out the wires since there's no cover right behind them. But this worked out quite well and in the end I just had a big old mess of wires that all needed to be connected up. Now eventually I might add a preamp to the piezos as they are relatively low output and kind of want a bit of an EQ on them. But for now uh, they are just treated like a passive humbucker uh, fed out uh, passively with just a volume knob and a tone knob. Uh, same for the pickups, they are also just uh, wired uh, passively. And I have a coil split on them with a push-pull on the tone knob and a uh, three-way selector switch, fairly standard wiring. Then the, the other uh, selector switch switches between either only magnetic pickups, magnetic and piezo, or only piezo. In the end, I think I prefer uh, the mix between the two actually for a lot of uh, clean playing. So using the neck pickup together with piezo uh, gives it like the nice warmth uh, and depth from the neck pickup, but still retains the crispness uh, with the piezo addition, in addition to it. The output of the piezo, as I said, is quite a bit lower, so uh, you have to either turn down the magnetic a bit uh, to have it match or just kind of live with it. Uh, in the end, I think for blending it, it actually does quite well and it just adds a little bit of the high-end sparkle from the piezos. And with that, all that was left to do was just final setup, uh, adjusting the string height and uh, saddle height and all of that intonation, all that good stuff, but I will not bore you with that and instead uh, leave you. I really hope that you enjoyed this build and if you have any more questions about my process, do leave them down in the comments and I will try to get back to you. With that said, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. There will definitely be more guitar related content here on this channel. I've now officially am in the process of rebranding from Dodge Love Tech to Dark Art Guitars. Uh, so over the next little while, uh, all of the branding will completely switch over. I'm still gonna keep the domains and stuff for uh, Dodge Love Tech active for at least a little while so that if anybody missed the memo, uh, uh, you aren't going to nowhere and thinking that channel disappeared. And there will also be not just guitar content on this channel. Uh, I will continue to making like CNC videos or other like guitar 
tool uh, uh, content or uh, like tools that you can use for an all kind of making but it's all going to be more focused towards uh, building guitars so with that thank you for watching and i'll see you guys next time